Good morning, everyone, uh, again, and welcome back to the ancient path that we are traveling through the ancient book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the first book of the Pentateuch. Um, here in this book, we have found our bearings, for we have seen the origins of planet Earth created in six days. We've seen the origins of the earliest promise of the Messiah already in chapter 3. We've seen the origins of the call to personal faith and the call to covenant living with God. Altogether, we are incredibly blessed to know where we've come from, why we're here, who's going to save us, and how we are to live. So knock, knock. Orange. Orange, you're glad we're spending all this time in Genesis. Last week we saw how hunger brought the brothers of Joseph to Egypt, and we also saw how hunger brought the prodigal son to his senses. For he said, I'm going back to my father, I'm going to confess my sins, and lo and behold, that's exactly what the prodigal son did. Because, as we were talking about last week, he felt the squeeze, he felt the burn, he felt the want, he felt the crisis, and he responded appropriately the hunger accomplished its purpose. But unfortunately, hunger doesn't always do the trick. Sometimes hungry people have a happy meal, and then they forget, and they go right back to the trough that they were at before. They didn't really change. They just took a couple steps forward, and then a couple or even three steps back. And now that is when God, in his perfect wisdom, God who knows the hearts of every man, has to send some harsher treatment into their lives. And that's where we are now in this next installment of this most fascinating story about Joseph's brothers. God used famine to bring the brothers down to Egypt where they could encounter Joseph. But encountering Joseph was one thing, Confessing their sins to him was another thing. And so they needed something a little bit more than hunger. And so God worked through Joseph to give them just what they needed. Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? he said. They said, from the land of Canaan, to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, No, my lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. He said to them, No, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, You are spies. By this you shall be tested. 
by the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you, and let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you. Or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. So we're told here in this section that the brothers went down to Egypt. They saw Joseph with their own eyes. They bowed their faces to the ground. And that while Joseph recognized his brothers these 22 years later, they did not recognize him. To Joseph, his brothers looked pretty much the same. Just a little grayer, a little thinner perhaps, a little more disheveled after this lengthy journey. But Joseph, on the other hand, did not look anything like he did before. For one thing, he was a fully grown man now. And for another thing, his appearance was that of an Egyptian. He looked like an Egyptian. He walked like an Egyptian. He talked like an Egyptian. And he dressed like a pharaoh in white linens and headdress. There is no way that his brothers could possibly recognize him. We're told that Joseph kept himself a stranger to them, and we're also told that he spoke roughly or spoke harshly to them. And we also begin to see now that his harsh words turned into harsh treatment as well. That included imprisonment, confinement, various other tests. But he began with words. Children in the schoolyard say that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, don't ask me where they learned that, because it sure is not true. Words do hurt, and they hurt a lot. Bandages and splints and time can repair the damage of sticks and stones, but words, they cut deeper. And I don't think there's a single person in this room who does not carry the wounds of some words. Even if these words were from decades ago, and even if these words were not insulting words, and they were not lies, and they were not labels either, because even the truth can cut deeply. Words can wound, but words can also work. Words can do the job. Words can awaken the conscience. Words can bring us to the point where we want to confess our sin, and that is exactly what Joseph is doing. I think some of us will read this story, and you've read the story, many of you, before, and we look at Joseph's harsh treatment of his brothers, and we listen to the harsh tone of his words, and we sort of cringe a little bit, or maybe cringe a lot, We say, yikes, Joseph is actually pretending not to be their brother. Joseph is acting cruelly against his brother. And we ask ourselves, isn't he going a little bit over the top on this? And we scratch our heads and we say, I think he's just trying to get revenge. I think he's just motivated by revenge against his brother. He's going to stick it to them. Now, if Angus Reed wasn't too busy with the election, he could take a poll among us. A poll that would be correct 19 times out of 20 with a standard deviation of plus or minus 5%. And most of us would agree that Joseph is going too far. Most of us would agree Joseph is going too far. And after, or actually before working on this message, I would have been part of the majority and said, yeah, I think he's going too far. But that was... A week ago, and a week ago I was naive. (laughs) A week ago I was sentimental, and I had taken a sentimental journey as far as this story was concerned. A week ago I was just one of Scotty's little softies, but not anymore because I think I get it now. I get four things. First of all, that this is not a sentimental story, not at all. This is a story about life and death. 
Secondly, this story does not occur in a soft and sentimental setting. This was ancient Egypt, a very cruel time and a very cruel place in history. Thirdly, Joseph is not a man given to sentimentalism. Joseph is not a man who is part of the Scotty's Little Softies army. Joseph is a tough-minded survivor. Scotty's Little Softies do not manage to adapt themselves to a whole new world and ascend to the level of general manager of Pharaoh's captain of the guard. Scotty's Little Softies do not overcome the injustice and the slander of false accusation and then survive years in an Egyptian dungeon of death and still get promoted to second in command and given the keys to the greatest nation on earth. That doesn't happen to Scotty's Little Softies, and nor should it ever. Scotty's Little Softies don't get very far in life. And we should let that sink in. Joseph was no sentimental softy. Joseph was a godly man for sure. But don't kid yourself, he was as tough as nails, and Joseph knew how to get the job done. Fourthly, let us not forget who Joseph is dealing with here. Joseph is dealing with a group of men who had committed serious crimes. These guys needed the kind of wise handling that Joseph exhibited. You don't play tiddlywinks with the Bacon brothers, right? Let's go back over the story of Joseph's brothers. One of the first things you'll read about them is how they tricked the Shechemites after the king's son had violated their only sister, Dinah. And what did they do? They proceeded to exterminate the entire village. And the way they did it was not pretty. Like members of a gang, they were not afraid to make a statement to the whole world. And oh, they made a statement, all right, because even their father said, you have ruined me. You've made me stink among all the peoples of this land. And I imagine the brothers went, so? Then there's the story about how one of the brothers had the audacity to sleep with one of his father's wives. There's that. And while we're on the topic of sex, we have another brother in chapter 38 who's having casual sex with his daughter-in-law, thinking she was a prostitute. And then, of course, we have the horrible crime of these brothers all together conspiring to sell their little brother, just 17 years old, to sell him into a life of Egyptian slavery. These were not your regular band of brothers. These guys were tough men. I call them hard bites because there's another word I want to say after the word hard, but I don't want to say it in church. They were hard bites. So I think we have to stop pointing our fingers at Joseph. Joseph, who is, I remind you, a foreshadowing of a type of Jesus Christ. Joseph is not after revenge any more than Jesus Christ is after revenge on any of us. Joseph is being as wise as a serpent in the way that he handled some extremely tough dudes. In fact, let's go even further. And let's say that Joseph is also conscious, very conscious, that he is a tool right here, right now, in the hands of of God. You say, how do we know that? Well, that's actually pretty easy to prove. The text says the very first thing he thought of were the dreams from 22 years earlier. Joseph recognized his brothers. They didn't recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams he had dreamed of them. Many times in the Joseph story, we uh, are told that he is a prophetic man, a prophetic type of man. He's a man who speaks the very words of God. He's a man who thinks the very thoughts of God. He's a man who does the very works of God. 
And as he sees his brothers coming, he immediately sees the hand of God in it. He didn't have to ponder it. He didn't have to think about it for a long time. He knew he had a role to play right here and right now. He was God's man and he knew it. He was God's tool and he knew it to soften up these hard bites, bringing them to the point of confession and one step closer to salvation. May God toughen up his people. Christians aren't necessarily known to be very tough people. But may God toughen up his people. May Scotty's little softies develop a few calluses. May Scotty's little softies find themselves a thicker skin sometimes so that they can be used by God even in difficult situations. Do you remember the dreams that Joseph had? He dreamed that his brothers would bow down to him one day. There were two dreams. The first was of 11 sheaves of grain bowing down to Joseph's sheaf of grain. And then there was the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars that were kneeling before him. And suddenly, here is the fulfillment right in front of his eyes. He sees his brothers coming and he sees them kneel before him. And it took him half a second to realize this was God at work. This was God's divinely orchestrated opportunity to be used. And my brothers and my sisters, please watch for your opportunities as well. Because God will give you and does give his people opportunities to be his instrument, to be his tool, to be his useful servant in that particular moment. And so what Joseph does is this. He reenacts the scene of the crime that took place 22 years ago. Have you ever thought of that? He reenacts the scene of the crime. Everything Joseph says, everything Joseph does is not random, and it is certainly not vengeance. It's calculated. It's purposeful in order to lead them to repentance. So step with me into the time machine. Let's go back 22 years to the scene of the crime, and there they are tending the sheep outside of Dothan. Ten troubled men, ten tough men guilty of all kinds of sins, some of them recorded in the scriptures, but you can imagine most of them not. Father Jacob sends his beloved son Joseph to go there. Joseph, who is now 17, and he's the foreman. 17, and he's the heir, a parent. 17, and he's the new owner of the birthright. We went over all of that background before. He's sporting his elaborate coat with its long, full-length sleeves, its floor length, a sign of his father's favor. They see him coming over the crest of the hill, and you can't miss him. They see him, and they burn with hatred against him. And as Joseph approaches, the text goes silent about what was said. But can you imagine what was said? It's not hard to imagine. I think it probably went something like this. Hey, looky, looky. Look who's coming. Oh, great. Hey, what you come here for, little Joey? Joey, Joey. Did you, did you come to spy on us? So you can go home and tell Daddy? <laughs> yeah, that's what you are. You're a little spy. Why, you little puke? You make me sick. You're daddy's little spy. Am I quoting the scriptures? Nope. But it would make sense because what did Joseph tell? What was the instruction he received from his father Jacob? The instruction was go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. In most circles, that's what you call a spy. Did you come spy on us? And now is Joseph the prime minister? He remembered. He's the, jo he's the prime minister now. He's the governor. And he sees his brothers coming for grain. And he's flashing back to that fateful day. And he's remembering their words. And he's considering what God is doing by fulfilling that dream. 
Now, what does he say? He says, you are spies. You've come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants are here to buy food. We're all sons of one man. We are honest men. <laughs> Except that we've lied every day for the last 22 years. But otherwise, we're honest men. Your servants have never been spies. First thing out of Joseph's mouth is your spies. Second thing out of his mouth, it is as I said, you are spies. Third thing out of his mouth, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. We can't prove it, but it's a reenactment of what happened 22 years ago. And the next thing that happens is prison. A pit. 22 years ago, Joseph was imprisoned in that cistern. 22 years later, his brothers are imprisoned in that, their own pit. But again, this is not revenge. It seems like revenge, but it's not. This is Joseph, the man of God, strong, tough, Wise, courageous, being used by God in a very difficult circumstance. He's applying harsh words and harsh treatment on some of the baddest, baddest Leroy Browns this side of the Mediterranean town to awaken their consciences. Was it, was it harsh? Yes, it was harsh. Does God speak harshly sometimes? Hmm. Is God direct and to the point sometimes? Mm-hmm. Does God hit the nail on the head? Yeah. Does that mean God's out of control? No. Does it mean God's seeking revenge? No. Does it mean that harsh treatment is somehow beneath him? No again. God has a job to do. And his job is to soften up rebellious sinners and stir up cold, dead consciences and bring people to the point of confession why? So they can be forgiven. So they can be set free. And so that they can start living a whole new life. This is God's desire. Of course, God has many words of comfort to speak. And God has many wonderful and great promises. I forget the number. We read that somewhere. It was up into thousands of promises. But the promises and the words of comfort in the Scriptures are for who? They are for those who have confessed their sin. Think about that. Those, all that comfort, all those promises, it's for those who have confessed their sin. All of His promises are yes and amen, but they cannot be yours until you do the hard work of repentance and confession of sin. To break a stone... You need a hammer. And I love this verse from Jeremiah chapter 23. Is not my word like a hammer that breaks a rock to pieces? How many of us have been reading the Bible at some point and just the hammer comes down? Words work. And they wound, but they also work. And by the grace of God, they can bring about a good confession. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Are you putting other gods before him? Are there things in your life that are taking precedence over him? When push comes to shove, it is, isn't it true that you've been choosing some other god over and above him? Do you own any idols? Idols that you've got tucked away in your own heart? Things that you love more than you love Him? Idols of success or money or idols of another person or idols of some vice or idols of some virtue or idols of your reputation? The hammer of God's Word says, don't. On the surface, the third commandment is about cursing and swearing. But digging deeper, we can ask the questions, do you ever misuse God's name for your own purposes? 
Is God just someone that you use to get what you want? Are the words in Jesus' name somehow magic words to you? Just so you can get things? God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God says, honor your father and mother that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. God says you should not murder. And Jesus elaborated on that and he said, and don't even let your anger outbursts come out of your mouth. God says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus elaborated and said, that includes lust. God says you should not steal. God says you should not give false testimony against your neighbor. And God says you should not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You know, there's not a single thing about God's word that is politically correct or diplomatic or even gentle for that matter. His words can sound pretty harsh. But God is direct in order that we can see our sins and confess our sins and be forgiven of our sins. That is always his goal. In conclusion, Joseph's brothers committed a lot of sins. But the greatest was to despise their brother because to them Joseph was an intruder on their wicked way of life. When Joseph showed up, they got angry at him. They said, you're a spy. You've come to spy on our sins. We don't want to get rid of our sins. We like our sins. We'll just get rid of you. And that's what they did. They grabbed him and they beat him and they abused him and they insulted him and they sold him and they got rid of Joseph. Or so they thought. You see the parallels? People think they can do the same thing with our brother, Jesus Christ. The Jews tried to banish him. The Pharisees tried to get rid of him. Pilate tried. Herod tried. Everybody tried. They arrested him. They beat him. They abused him. They crucified him. But somehow, he still appears before us today. There is his cross. There is his table of communion. His tomb is empty. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's praying for you and for me right now. And God wants to draw out of every one of us a confession of our guilt for our treatment of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior, and a confession of our sins. The most glorious thing is that whenever we confess our sins, he is not vindictive and he is not vengeful. He is gracious, just as we're going to see Joseph be gracious to his brothers. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness every single time. And you will find that everything that you need to be forgiven has already been done. Everything we need for forgiveness has already been done. He came to earth. He went to the cross. He died for your sins that you might have eternal life. Amen.